Well, the University of Lethbridge has received a $100,000 grant from the Canadian Space Agency to train the next generation of space scientists. The U of L is one of 21 post-secondary institutions in the country to receive a grant through the CSA's flights and field work for the advancement of science and technology funding initiative. It's a mouthful, but joining me now to discuss this is Dr. David Naylor. He is the physics and astronomy professor and the head of the Astronomical Instrumentation Group at the University of Lethbridge. Dr. Naylor, thanks so much for joining me today. Hey, appreciate it. Okay, awesome. So, Dr. Naylor, this is big, exciting news for the university and for Canada, I would say, but I'm going to let you explain what this grant is for exactly because it's kind of a mouthful. So, in a nutshell, it's to train the next generation of space scientists in the development of what? A cryogenic something? Yes. So, um, so most, of, most of your viewers may know that Canada is going to be uh, going to the moon. Uh, on a project called the Lunar Gateway. And the Canadian Space Agency has uh, joined forces with NASA to, uh, on, this, on this project that will see the Canadian, a Canadian be the second nation on the boots on the ground on the moon. So someone in school today will be a, a Canadian who will have uh, be the first, only the second nation to step foot on the moon, which is really exciting. And so, um, the Canadian Space Agency funds development in technology uh, so that you mitigate the risk. So things that space is risk, that's all it is as a, as a, and you have to mitigate that. And you need to train the next generation of uh, students who become scientists in the technology that will be needed for the future generations. So that's what this is all about. And uh, we're particularly targeting technology that will, uh, that has a path to the moon and some other, uh, experiments that we're dealing with as well. That's incredible news. It's very exciting. And so what will this grant money do exactly? What will the U of L do with it? So when you, when you do research, there, there are two things you look at. One is getting the equipment, the infrastructure, the hardware. And the, the second is the money to train students. And so we, we have, we've been given funding from different grants for equipment. Uh, we have four industrial partners that are contributing upwards of $2 million. And this piece of the puzzle is for training of students. So these students will be um, high school students, possibly. We have had some in the past, uh, undergraduate students, graduate students, and, and so forth. So we're training uh, the, the next generation of bright minds on the technology that will be required to tackle the problems that will be coming down the the pipes in the coming years. That's amazing. So maybe paint a picture for me. So what will the students and researchers be able to do because of this grant and this program? So, so most people don't realize that the moon, the moon in some ways is actually harder than Mars as an environment. Mars is, is really uh, uh, about a temperature of minus 50 degrees, uh, minus 60 degrees Celsius. So. Antarctica is actually colder than Mars, but the moon gets significantly colder around you know, 200 Celsius, minus 200 Celsius. And, and that is because of its orbit and it sheltered its, the night on the moon is 14 Earth days. So uh, it means that surviving lunar night is a real challenge and you have to have instrumentation that's checked out to do that. And we have the largest cryogenic test facility, which is kind of like an enormous beer fridge. I mean, it gets much colder, much faster, but it, but it cools to uh, temperatures that, that nowhere else can be achieved, really, for the volume that we have. So we can, we can in principle, uh, cool a small rover, a medium rover and a nano rover in our cryogenic facilities. So students will be exposed to the technology that is associated with this kind of work. Basically, when you put things, if you get a glass of pop and put an ice cube in it, it, it cracks, it shatters. That thermal gradient just causes the ice cube to crack when you have a pop from the fridge. And pretty much everything you cool to these temperatures breaks. The optical, thermal, electrical, mechanical properties, everything, the properties of everything just fail as you get to extremely low temperatures. And you, so you must be able to design systems that will survive 
extreme cooling. And that's, the, uh, that's what we're doing, doing. Interesting. The CSA calls it the Flights and Fieldwork for Space Technology, but they, the acronym is FAST. It's a very nice acronym. It's basically you have to simulate a space environment. And we're one of the few labs in, the, in Canada that can really do that. That's amazing. I, I was getting freezing just hearing you describe what the moon feels like, that minus 200 degrees, 14 night. Well, I guess one night is equivalent to 14 days. That is unbelievable. So this project must simulate a realistic space environment. So uh, what does that look like in terms of what the students will be doing in the lab at the U of L? Can you maybe give us some examples? It looks like a, a big... Uh metal tank. You can imagine it as a submarine. When you, when you go in a submarine, it takes, it takes some damn time to get down to the bottom of the ocean. And you can stay there for a long time, but you must be careful when you ascend. You can't come up too quickly or you will get the bends. And it's, it's a similar in the sense that when you cool down, like the ice cube in the glass of pop, if you cool down too quickly, the ice cube will shatter. And so we have got to go down to extremely low temperatures and, and we can stay there pretty much indefinitely, which is just surprising. And we can get 10 times colder than anywhere in the universe can be. With our cryostat, we can actually get down to 0 0.3 Kelvin. So it takes a long time to get down there, uh, but then we can stay there. And our record is almost a couple of months staying at that low temperature. And the problem, like a submarine, if you if you forget to take your toothpaste, then you know you're stuck because you've got to wait to come up. So when we when we cool things, we've got to be absolutely sure that we have everything in the cryostat that we will need uh, as we go down. So it's it's meticulous work, it's careful work, and uh, and we're pretty good at what we do here. So we're training the next generation of students in in this technology. Okay, so Dr. Naylor, is this cryogenic tank actually physically at the University of Lethbridge then, or is it off-site somewhere? No, no, no. It's on uh, it's on the top level of the new science building. So uh, we're we're actually we have to be on the top level because we need a lot of uh, compressors to to cool it. So they're in the penthouse, and so we're on level nine in the science building, and it was designed. Uh, fit for purpose. So this is the first time we've had a, a lab that's been equipped specifically for this task. That's absolutely incredible. So this new type of spectrometer has been identified by the world's leading space agencies like NASA, right, as a necessary step to explore the galaxy. Can you explain why? It, it, it gets uh, tricky pretty quickly, but we now know the now know the so when you explore the universe, you look at different wavelengths, different colors. Uh, so with your eye, you can see the planets out there tonight. But it turns out that most of the energy emitted by the universe is detected in the infrared. That's beyond the limit of human vision. And so you need certain types of detectors and certain types of instrumentation. And um, the physics is complex, but but it's pretty. It boils down to the fact that you have to cool your detectors to extremely low temperatures to work. And then you've got com competing uh, contrasting requirements. You would like to cover a full spectral band, a broad spectral band. So if you were thinking about the rainbow of colors, you, you've got green through to uh, yellow through to red, you've got the whole rainbow. And at the same time, you might want to know, well, is it you know lemon yellow or, or is it um, a bolder yellow within the, the color range? And so the, the task is to cover a broad spectral range at very high spectral resolution. And that's a challenge. And uh, so the space agencies have realized that this a hybrid technology is going to be required. And uh, NASA has identified this, uh, the European Space Agency with whom we do a lot of work as well. They know that this is the, the route to go. And so um, it's on the technology gap. Every year, NASA publishes a technology gap review. Where are we missing in technology? And then the world scientists like ourselves try to fill in those gaps uh, as best we can. So uh, yeah, I think it's, we, we know, Einstein said the smartest person is the one who poses the right question, not whether you can answer it. The right question is that we need this type of instrument. And now we're trying to develop uh, the, the instrument, which is well on the path, and we need to train the next generation of students in, in how to use it, really.
Okay, so we've pretty much determined that this is an important step in future, the future of space exploration. So could something like this reduce future mission risk and cost then? Well, yes. I mean, space is all about risk. I mean, you don't get into this game if, if you're risk averse. Um, so you have, to, you have to make sure you've got redundancy, full redundancy. So whenever we launch anything, you, you make sure that there are ways that you can reprogram it. You, you basically carry two of everything, two lasers, two detectors, two, two drives, two, two whatever it is, you have redundancy. And then you also have a redundancy in your uh, hardware your firmware, and so you can reprogram and reconfigure the spacecraft should there be uh, problems. And so what you don't want to do, and we've been, I've been involved in space for four decades. I worked at the European Space Agency. What you don't want to do is to launch something and then find out, oh, it doesn't work, and here's why. And we've, we've been in those positions. And so you do as much testing, soaking as you can, and you try, and now the requirement is you must test in a realistic space condition. And that's, that's, the new, that's the new space driver that you must be able to show that you can evaluate the performance of your instrument in the conditions that it's going to experience once it gets out there. And that is what we do. So we can generate, we've got one of the most realistic space uh, simulators in Canada because of the low temperature side. M most, many people can uh, generate a, a high vacuum but we have uh, high vacuum and extremely low temperatures, and that's precisely what, what is going to be needed to, uh, to reduce the risk. So we need to identify problems on the ground where we have a chance of fixing them and redesigning them before we launch a $10 billion thing, and then we find out, oh yeah, we should have thought about that. So Dr. Naylor, has the University of Lethbridge taken part in any such study or project before? Like maybe you can explain in what ways the U of L has shaped space exploration in the past, or is this a first for the university? The University of Lethbridge, our group's been funded by the Canadian Space Agency for uh, almost 20 years. Uh, we've been funded by ESA as well, and, uh, and, and also NASA, actually. We have an instrument that flew on a, a U-2 aircraft, uh, Earth ER-2 aircraft. So we're, we're pretty old hands at this, and uh, we built up the technology over, as I say, over several decades to become uh, re really the leading cryogenic space facility in Canada. That's amazing. Has Canada had much in, like, involvement in influencing space exploration? You know, that uh, yes and no. We're a small country, really, and so the tax base is small. So our space agency does not get the kind of funding that NASA does, for sure. Uh, Europe, uh, the countries in Europe joined together to form the European Space Agency, and you have, I forget the number, but it's probably 15 countries, maybe more, and they each chip in, and then they do big things. Japan does it on its own, Russia did it, did it on its own, China does it on its own. So Canada can't do it on its own, we just don't have the resources to do it, but there are a lot of really talented scientists and engineers in Canada, and what happens is that NASA and ESA invite us to join their teams. So Canada gets involved in space because of the expertise and excellence that exists in the professors in, in uh, universities across Canada. And it, it's interesting because we, because we have ties with Europe and, and America, we actually get involved with both agencies. I've worked with NASA and with ESA, and sometimes NASA and ESA don't work well together, but, but we, we're in a kind of a neat position that we can join forces with both. And we get invited to. So we've been invited to participate in, in a mission that is being considered by NASA. That is extremely, extremely cool. How much time do you think it will, it will be before can, a Canadian steps foot on the moon? Well, the, uh, the, I mean, that's a good question. Canada joined into the Lunar Gateway project. So uh, Prime Minister Trudeau committed $2 billion to that, to that effort. And in return for supporting that work, Canada gets a, a flight to the moon for a Canadian. So the second nationality to step foot on the moon uh, will not be Russian or Chinese. Well, I mean, perhaps it could be, but it is going to be a Canadian after Americans, which is really kind of exciting. We don't actually know yet. The Artemis, uh, Artemis project is going to go back 
and uh, they're thinking probably 2025. And uh, when the Canadian will be there, it's not clear. There will be a launch slot and a seat on, on, on the spacecraft, but uh, it really will be a big thing for Canada. Oh, it's giving me chills just thinking about it. Uh, Dr. Naylor, thanks so much for joining me today and uh, all the best in this study. Hey, I appreciate it, thanks. Absolutely, Dr. David Naylor is a physics and astronomy professor and head of the Astronomical Instrumentation Group at the University of Lethbridge.